morning. Good morning. It's another Sunday we get to be together in the house of the Lord. As always, uh, you know, we mentioned to take a look at the bulletin. A lot of work goes into putting that together. Lots of good information in there and things to be aware of uh, happening in the life of the Cory Alliance Church. I uh, want to draw your attention to mark your calendars is we do have a missions conference coming up on October 22nd and the 23rd. Uh, there's some good plans in the works and uh, I know uh, growing up in the church I always looked forward to those and hearing what God was doing in other countries and, uh, and how ministry works uh, outside of the U.S. So come and uh, hear some great things of what God has been doing. Uh, we uh, announced a, a while back that there's going to be a cross-country meet, and as you know, that one got rained out. Well, good news, tomorrow the weather looks really good. Uh, so we encourage you to come out, support the uh, cross-country team that does their practices out of here. Uh, that's going to start at 5 in the afternoon tomorrow. And as I said before, it's really impressive what these kids do. Um, they go running up and down the hills and through the woods. And the best part, you can just stand on the top of the hill and pretty much see the whole race. So uh, come on out and uh, be ready to cheer for them. Uh, we are having the uh, fall harvest party. Uh, that's going to be on Saturday, October 29th from 6 to 7.30. That being said, as you know, we need candy. Um, so bring in your donations for the annual harvest party for the kids, uh, and you can drop those off at the office. And we do taste test the candy to make sure it's safe, just in case you're worried about that. So please bring lots of candy. Uh, oh, come on. That was funny, I thought. <laughs> All right. uh, if you have not noticed, uh, out in the foyer there is a table with a variety of books. Uh, we're doing a little bit of house cleaning here. Uh, we've found some books that I uh, believe some maybe could give a good home to. I believe this will be the last day they'll be out there. Uh, so be sure to check that out and see if there's anything uh, that you would enjoy. Again, we always encourage you to check out the Life Resource Center. And uh, we mentioned last week about the Hoopla service, which is provided by the Erie County Libraries. Uh, you do need a library card uh, number uh, for that. So a little plug for the library. But a lot of the resources, the books that we mention um, to check out that maybe aren't there, but we do a listing of different resources that would be a benefit to you and your family and to others, you can access them for free digitally, um, either to read and or um, they have the audio versions of it. And they are very well done audio versions. If you have any questions about that, speak to Rebecca and I. Uh, we've been using that uh, quite regularly and it's been a blessing to us. And I know it would be a blessing to you as well. At this time, we get the privilege to worship our Lord together this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Why don't you stand and join us for worship, please?
come here this morning, we just call upon you, Lord. We call upon your name. And Lord, sometimes the world can be confusing and can be scary, Lord, but Lord, we just put our trust and our hope in you. And Lord, we just love you for that. Lord, I pray you just bless the service. You bless the message this morning. That you would just, just search us this morning. Search us somewhere deep in our hearts, Lord, that you know that there's something in our lives that we need to turn over to you, something in our lives that we need to hear this morning. And I pray you'll just make that clear and evident to us. And we just love you. We just thank you for all you do. And we pray. Amen. Romans 16, verses 16 to 20. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the church of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, I thank you for the body of Christ that is represented here. Lord, I thank you that we have the privilege to come together as the body to sing your praises, to hear your word, and Lord, that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your blessings. Lord, I pray that you would guard and direct our steps. Lord, that we would be wise and discerning. Lord, that we would be cautious of where our feet tread. Lord, that we would hold fast to you. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Lord, thank you for the blessing of your offering. Thank you for the provisions. Lord, I pray that they'd be used to further your kingdom. And Lord, may we all be found faithful in our service to you. Lord, thank you so much for this privilege that we have. Just draw us closer to you. Is your name. Amen. At this time, uh, we have a presentation from our Gideon's representative, uh, Bob Mitchell. So I welcome him up here. Good morning. You've probably never heard of Martha Schistler, but she and her invalid mother traveled from Bradenton, Florida, up to Illinois for a series of medical appointments that her mother had. When they got to the motel that night, Martha had brought a novel along with her to read, but it just didn't seem right. She was unduly worried and concerned about her mother and her mother's health. She looked over in the night sand and she saw a book there. She picked it up. Martha and her mother were not churchgoers. She was really unfamiliar with the Bible, so she treated it just like any other book. She opened to the first page and started reading. She got to the story of Joseph, and she was so impressed with God's providential care of Joseph that she had to wake up her mother and read the story to her mother. They spent a week there in uh, Illinois, and as, each day as they came back from their medical appointments, they came back to the motel. Martha read a little bit more. Some she read to herself, some she read aloud to her mother. When they left the motel at the end of the week to go back to Bradenton, as I said, Martha and her mother weren't church goers. They didn't have a Bible of their own. They took that motel Bible, put it in their suitcase, took it back to Florida with them. Now, I used to say that we don't recommend taking the Bibles out of the motel rooms. Since then, I've been corrected. We do encourage stealing. If you don't have a Bible of your own, take one out of the motel rooms. We will replace it. Well, Martha and her mother took that Bible back to Bradenton, continued reading it nightly for a month. At the end of that month, they both gave their lives to Jesus. Martha and her mother were both very glad that someone had placed that Bible in that motel room. We estimate that over its useful lifespan of about six years, each motel Bible has a possibility of reaching about 2,300 different readers. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning on behalf of the Gideons International. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and worship with you. 
Most of you are at least a little bit familiar with the work of the Gideons. You know that we're the people that place the Bibles in the motel rooms. But you may not know that we are an interdenominational group of Christian business professional men and women that take very seriously the word that God gave Isaiah in the 55th chapter and the 11th verse. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purposes unto which I have sent it. There are now almost 200,000 Gideons serving as an extended missionary arm of your church in over 200 countries throughout the world. We distribute God's word in over 100 different languages. Our purpose is the same as yours, both individually and as a church, to win men, women, boys, and girls to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We accomplish this purpose through the distribution and placement of scriptures. We make God's word available not only in hospitals, convalescent homes, jails, military induction centers, and college and university campuses, or for that matter, wherever God opens doors. We trust God to accomplish his purposes with his word. Jim and Ed Potsky had gotten lost uh, after leaving a camp meeting in Minneapolis. It was late at night and they were trying to find their way back to I-35 and they found themselves in a dark, deserted area of the city. And as they were driving along, they spotted a group of rough looking guys standing over on the street corner. Jim, being from a small town, had faith in his fellow man and decided to stop and ask for directions. Ed, being from a small town, uh, wasn't quite so sure, so he decided to stay in the car. As Jim uh, approached this group, he noticed that one of the guys was talking to the other four, and he was reading out a small book. As Jim got closer, he learned that this guy had just got, been released from prison, and while in prison, he had been given a Gideon New Testament and come to know Jesus as a savior. And he was sharing his faith with his four buddies from before. He asked Jim if he, might, if he knew where they might be able to find some New Testaments for these guys. Jim said, well, I just might happen to have some in the car. And they walked over to the car. Jim pulled out four New Testaments, gave them to the guys. They, Jim prayed with them, shared the, the helps in the back in our plan of salvation. And all four of them came to know Jesus as Savior. Now I ask you, what are the chances the men would be praying for Testaments? Total strangers would get lost, stop in a deserted area in the dead of night, ask for directions, and that these strangers would have exactly the number of New Testaments these guys needed. Some people hear that story and say, my, what a coincidence. I hear that story and I say, there's my God at work. He knew where those New Testaments needed to be. We also distribute scriptures internationally. One of the exciting newer areas of ministry is in the former Soviet Union. In one of their very first distributions, the Russian Gideons were given six lecture halls at the University of Moscow. Uh, they daily had full houses of faculty and students who came to hear about Christianity and receive a copy of God's word. Over 23,000 scriptures were distributed in that week. Later, a Gideon was speaking at a, a um, large church in Canada. On that same program was a Russian concert pianist, and when he heard this account, he said that he had been at that distribution, and he had taken a New Testament there at, the Mos at uh, Moscow University. And he took the New Testament because it was a bilingual New Testament. It had English on one side and Russia on the other side, and he took it solely to improve his English. He would read the Russian and then he would read the English and thus he became better at the English language. Guess what happened? As he read the word of God, God's word spoke to him. God touched his heart. He came to know Jesus because of it. God used his word for his purposes. Many times as we distribute uh, New Testaments and Bibles, we don't know what impact it will have or how it will be used. But we can take comfort in the words found in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
You've heard this morning how our work has not been in vain. We've distributed God's word, and he's used it to achieve his purposes. People come to know Jesus Christ as Savior when they receive and read the New Testaments and Bibles that are placed in various places in various ways. What can you do to help assist this ministry and help fulfill the Great Commission? First, and by far foremost, you can pray for us. This really isn't a work that I do. It's a work that the Holy Spirit does. My job is easy. I walk into an empty motel room, place a Bible on the shelf, walk out. I stand on a street corner, and as people come by, I say, would you like a free New Testament? Would you like a free copy of God's Word? They either take it or they don't. My job is easy. This is a work done by the Holy Spirit, and that's only accomplished through your faithful prayers. People sometimes say, well, all I can do is pray for you. And you know you're right. That is all you can do is pray for us. And if you pray for us, you've done as much as you possibly can. God will bless his work. God will use his work. But I also want to give you the opportunity to support us financially. If you're willing and able to do so, there are are several ways that you can do that. In your bulletin this morning, you should have received an insert from us. Read through it. This has uh, Gideon's story much better than I could present it. Uh, on the back, you can find our website. You can go to the website. There's more stories there, more accounts, more information. Um, for those of you who want to support us, you can do it the old-fashioned way. There's a nice tear-off envelope here. It's addressed to us. Tear it off. Put your contribution in it. Mail it to us. For those of you in the 21st century, we have the quick, re quick response code here on the back. You can use your smartphone sitting right there at your desk and make a contribution if you know how to use your smartphone. I can't do it. My kids probably could. But if you can, you can. If you can't, mail it to us. There is also a nice display in the back just outside the door of our Gideon card display. We have some nice greeting cards out there. These cards are free for the taking and free for the using. Open them up. There's a nice place in there to, to write a personal message. Send it to someone you want to honor. This one says, on your special day. So someone you want to honor for some particular reason. And you can donate Bibles on their behalf. And then there should also, in the envelope, be a donation card. Send the donation to us. Send the card to the person you want to honor. My kids are always asking me for my birthday or Father's Day or Christmas or whatever is coming up. Dad, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? Well, all you have to do is look in my attic or look in my basement and know that I don't need anything more. Right there is the perfect gift for the man that has everything. Send Bibles in his name. Lives will be changed. He'll be blessed. Because you prayed, were involved, and gave financially, Gideons have been able to distribute the word of God. Gideons went to a church or a motel in Orange County, California. And as they got there, the owner threw his hands up in the air and said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. An inspector had been there that week and written up 15 deficiencies. Deficiency number seven was no Bibles in the hotel rooms. Gideons were thus able to place 150 Bibles in that motel room. In the closing this morning, the Gideon message can re be remembered very easily by remembering three M's. We are the men and women of the church using the money of the church to take the message of the church to the world. Thank you very much for your time and attention this morning. Thank you. in my heart I know you've won I know you've overcome and even in the 
dark When I'm undone I still believe it I live by faith And not by sight Sometimes miracles Take time While I wait I worship Lord, I worship
Please join with us in singing hymn number 353, We're Marching to Zion. Sixty-eight times, uh, the Bible uses the expression one another to describe how God's people are to relate one to another. And uh, I've taken those 68 and broken them into 10 categories, and this morning we're up to category three. Uh, I shouldn't have said category three, it's reminiscent of uh, storms, but it is category three. Uh, the first study dealt with the fact that we're part of one another. And there are six descriptions in the one another's of how God's people are part of one another. We share all these things in common. Uh, common authority, a common family, a common life, on and on. Common things. We're, we're connected. Then there are passages that relate to loving one another. Usually that's the most familiar uh, expression when people talk about the one another's. We're to love one another. And there are all kinds of uh, reasons why we're given to show love a one to another. And it's a one another, it's like a ping pong game. It goes, it goes back and forth. It, there's a mutual responsibility um, among God's people back and forth loving one another. It's not a one-way street. Uh, I have two, I have for years had two seashells on my desk in, in my office. <coughs> And um, I, I was going to hold them in my hand. I don't know where they are, but they're somewhere at 208 Main Street uh, in Spartansburg. It's either in the garage, still packed, or somewhere uh, in the library that's all on the shelves. But anyway, I'll show them to you someday. 
I got one of those shells uh, when I was a pastor in Bowie, Maryland. We had a preschool and a daycare program, and there was a little girl in our program named Gina, and she stopped one day and t- told me this story about how she had gone to the ocean and collected these seashells, and she wanted to, to give me a, a seashell. And so I accepted it, I thanked her for it, and I told her I'd put it uh, on my desk, and, and I did. And from the time, that time until we moved to Watertown, New York in 1990, we were there in Bowie for 13 years, she would ask me, um, is the shell still on your desk? And I'd say, yes, it is, Gina. And sometimes she'd ask me several times a day if it was still on my desk. And she'd walk by my office, we'd take a nap in a different part of the building, and she'd stop at the door, if the door was open, stop and look to see if the shell was on the desk. And um, sometime after that, another little girl heard about the shell on my desk, and she wanted to know if, if uh, she could have a shell on my desk. And Gina said, no, no, there's, <laughs> no, there's no room. What? A little seashell? No room? But in Gina's mind, that was uh, moving in on a relationship. And I said, oh, no, no, no. there's room on the desk. We'll put them both out there. And so Gina would continue to ask. The other little girl never asked me again. It was just on the desk, and that was all she needed. But Gina needed reassured that there was a place in my life and in my interest to receive this gift and to enjoy this gift Uh, day after day on my desk. Loving people means simply making room for them or making room for their things that have a story connected to them. And uh, I often wonder where Gina is today and what she's doing. There are There are many ways affection can be shown. A thumbs up, a pat on the back, uh, a handshake, a thank you, speaking kindly. There are many ways affection and love can be shared. One of the ways is how we greet one another. And uh, this this is a study in greeting one another. And there are four aspects to the meaning of greeting one another that we're told to do in the scriptures. The first one means to simply initiate recognition. Romans 16:16, 16, 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. Uh, we'll get to the kiss in a minute. Saluting is a response of recognition, like I recognize you. The Greek word salute means to to greet, or to welcome. And this particular salute is not with a raised hand, uh, but it was a a gesture uh, expressed in kissing. Now, apart from romantic kissing, which the Bible does talk about, uh, kissing in the scriptures is between men and between women. Sorry. I never announce that I'm speaking about greet one another with a holy kiss out of fear that eligible young men will position themselves around eligible young girls and upset the seating pattern uh, in the church. And there is a seating pattern in the church. I just met some uh, new friends here, and I pointed up here near where uh, Sharon Brad sit, that that's where Dutch and Phyllis would sit. And if we came to church late, we were visiting, we came into town late, and, and at church we knew where to go to, to sit with them. Anyway, so I don't announce ahead of time I'm talking about this subject. The, the theme of kissing uh, in the culture of the New Testament is it's a, it's a friendship, kinship kind of thing. It's homage to a superior, and it's mutual affection and equality, three different reasons behind the meaning of of a holy kiss. Let me take them. There's friendship and kinship. And there are seven scriptures throughout the Old Testament where uh, Jacob kissed his father. 
Esau embraced and kissed Jacob. Joseph kissed all his brethren. Jacob kissed and embraced Joseph's son. On and on it goes, seven different places. That's the kinship. Then there's homage to a superior. When Samuel anointed Saul, he kissed him. It was a way of showing respect to the king from uh, Samuel uh, the prophet. And then there's mutual affection and equality shown with the kiss. It's not only used among men as a token of friendship, but it's um, homage to a superior. But one of the ceremonies connected with divine worship was the expression uh, in the synagogue, and we believe that this was passed on to the early church where there was a holy kiss given during the worship service. The... uh, History teaches us that uh, the minister would say to the congregation, peace to you, and then uh, a deacon goes on to proclaim a message about the meaning of a holy kiss, and um, the clergy would salute the bishop with a kiss, the layman, their fellow layman, men with men and women with women. That's out of the antiquities of Josephus. Anyway, a little history there. Anyway, let me dip into the meaning of Scripture, the interpretation of Scripture. Um, What we look for is a cultural equivalent to what goes on in the Bible. What is a cultural equivalent in our culture for this? And in our culture, this would be uh, a handshake, a hug, a pat on the back, a fist bump. It would be a gesture that would be socially acceptable Uh, in our culture of sharing affection and connectedness. So to greet one another means to initiate, uh, initiate recognition and to acknowledge the presence of another person. Um, There are times that things that are obvious just need to be said. I said to a guy the other week, it's not inappropriate to state the obvious. Sometimes the obvious just needs to be stated. And I went on to say, and he agreed with me, and went on to say what a meaningful event we were part of, and we just needed to acknowledge what a, what a good thing this, this was. Have you ever been in an office, a place of business, and nobody acknowledged you? You walk in, you wonder, here I am. <laughs> you know, hello. Um, I, I was raised in an environment where you recognize people. Uh, when I was hauling water and oil from 03 to 2020, if somebody walked into the office uh, where I worked. If, if, if the drivers were in there, a bunch of old guys smelling like oil and grease, and a lady comes in to pay her oil bill or something like that, we always said hello to her and welcomed her, and or men or what, whatever. You welcome people into your business. It's the way just the way things ought to be. So, so it's the initiation of recognition, like you're here. Hello, how are you? How can I help you? Those kinds of things. Now, there are places where this recognition is expressed, and I talk about the sphere of them or the realm where you express this, recognize. When we come home, we, we recognize, oh, hello, sweetie pie, how are you? How'd your day go? The, sol- the story I told about a soldier coming home when he was at Fort Drum and how he would greet his family and welcome his family and connect with his family. This initiation of recognition is important. Uh, We don't just come in, we come in, we recognize, we acknowledge the presence of people in our home. In the gathering of the church, we do this in in the fellowship, not just the moment of fellowship that we have uh, during the worship service, but we greet one another um, when we see each other and acknowledge the presence of one another. It's nice to see it. Brad, it's nice to see it. Brad has a birthday coming up. There are other people in the bulletin who have birthdays coming up. So uh, acknowledge those things. Um, so in the gathered church and in the worship, in Christian worship, not just uh, when we greet one another uh, in the name of the Lord and welcome. I met some people here who... Uh, I, told them a little story about my background. Uh, they're from out of state, and they're here on ministry. And so I have a new friend. Told them where they can see my father-in-law and mother-in-law's pictures down at Mount Miracle Art Ranch on the wall, sitting on horses. In the Christian community at large, we acknowledge the presence of one another. When we go out in the community, we meet Christian people. You know, the idea of initiating recognition that you count your presence is important to us 
And so we just simply acknowledge one another. It seems like a simple thing, but it needs to be said because we live in a culture that's more and more distant. And, and the thing, I went, uh, I, not this year at the fair, but last year at the fair, I went to shake a hand of a guy and he jumped back like, like I was poison. He was practicing social distancing, and I forgot uh, I went to shake his hand. I could say more, but I won't. We've done all kinds of things to distance people, ignore people, and, and not be near people, and this is not a healthy situation. It's important to recognize, initiate the recognition of another person. Hello, I'm glad you're here this morning. God bless you. Uh, the second aspect in uh, the, the meaning of greeting one another is um, it means to affirm, uh, affirm someone beyond our immediate interests. Uh, it's so easy to be taken up with our own interests and in, in our own world. Uh, we're prone to only think about ourselves and what we're doing and... Um, when, when I was hauling water, uh, topping off swimming pools, uh, the dispatcher, if you're a dispatcher, uh, send, send the same person to the same delivery. This helps the driver, okay? And no need to mix it up. Don't, be, don't give a lot of variety. If the guy knows where he's going, send him there again. It just makes life easy. You have 80,000 pounds, it's long, it bends in the middle, it's called a truck. You're backing in off a street on a side street, so they sent, anyway, Frank did a great job of dispatching. So, so I'd, I'd make this top off, and you back in this side street, and uh, before you move the truck, when you're done, you walk around it, make sure it's safe, you don't want to do any damage, you don't want to hit anything, no animals sleeping under the truck, because the engine's warm, and they lay under the engine, and it's warm. You get everything away, and I'm getting, in, I'm getting the truck, and I'm pulling out. And here's this little girl I noticed on the sidewalk with a piece of paper. And uh, she has this paper, and she's looking up. She's on the sidewalk looking up at me. So I get out and say, what are you doing? And she said, I made these, and I'm giving them away. Now, when a child is going to give you something, you don't say what it is. You say, tell me about it. Well, tell me about this paper. And she proceeds to tell me that this is a drawing of M&Ms. And she would like to give me this paper. And so I said to her, I'd be happy to have that paper. And I'm going to put it in my office and, and post it up. Now, I had more deliveries to do. I had a schedule to meet. I had all this other kind of stuff. I've got this big vehicle. I've got cars all over the place. But greeting her is a way of moving out of my interests and into her interests. And if the little girl was interested in moving into my world, I was certainly interested in the moving into her world, and I took the painting, the, the paper, and I've got that in the file. I keep shells and drawings and stuff like that. Um, so, greeting one another is a way of moving out of my world into somebody else's world and seeing what's going on. And we are called as people to show an interest in other people. This is not some big deal. It's not nuclear energy or rocket science or something. It's important to move into the life of another person. Um, how is this practiced in the home? Well, the story I told last week about the soldier coming home and laid down on the floor and his kids would pile on him and his wife would pile on him and he'd say to her, tell me about your day. It's a way of moving into the other person's world. This can be practiced uh, in, in the church where we move into other people's worlds. Yeah. Um, I ask my new friends, uh, do you live here? No, they're out of state. 
and on and on. It, it goes as to why they're here. This is interesting. I moved into their world. They moved into my world. They probably learned more about me than, than they needed to know. But now, now they know that Dutch and Phyllis are my in-laws. And I'm appreci appreciative of them. So the, the idea of moving out of our world into the other person's world is part of Christian greeting. And that's what, what's, that's what the New Testament scriptures about greeting one another have to do with. We're moving into the other person's world. To greet also means to enlarge your social status. In the first century, the inferior kissed the superior. Paul didn't say you were of a lower class are to kiss the higher class. He said you're to kiss one another. It's a leveling out of worth. And so it doesn't matter what a person's social status is the gesture of greeting levels the ground. It isn't an inferior saluting a superior, it's one another. It levels the ground. The, it's not a thing of the lower greeting the higher, it's a thing that God's people are to greet one another. It works both ways. In the, now, there's a good example of how our Christian faith rubs against the culture of the day. Um, we need to understand what's going on in the culture. But there are things about all cultures that are inappropriate. And one of them is this inequality of, of people. That, that you have a certain social status and you're locked into that and that's what you are. And... Um, uh, I don't, I don't buy into that. And this is a good example of the worth of all people. It, it's simple, worth of all people. Now, we recognize that when we come into our home. Um, I heard a person say one time to a lady, shut up, you're a woman. And I said, what? Or, uh, be quiet, you're a kid. Well... <laughs> The, the idea of worth and value um, is throughout the scriptures, and we're to greet one another, and so we don't classify um, a child as unimportant, or we don't classify a gender as unimportant. The fact is, we're to greet one another, and the whole idea... Um, of, of the Christian home is that the Christian home is to model this sense of the worth of, of all people. And so, um, I, don't, I, I don't just hang out with people who have doctor's degrees. I have a doctor's degree, but I have friends who don't have doctor's degrees. And this reminds me of my old buddy, Charlie Jones, who said, I'd rather have a person say he seen something when he saw it than somebody say they saw something and they ain't seen nothing. Think about it. So I, I have all kinds of friends, loggers, truckers, mechanics, ladies who are chefs, ladies who are cooks, kids who give me shells, kids who give me... Paper. This is a picture <laughs> of M&Ms. How many of you have a picture handmade of M&Ms? I bet none of you. I have one. It's great. So the whole idea of getting beyond our social status. Um, the boys who grew, uh, two sons grew up in our home. Uh, you know, we entertained the Catholic priest from our town. We. We had loggers and truckers. We had government investigators. We had a government investigator who'd come from the West Coast to the East Coast, and he'd say, I'll be free from 2 to 4 a.m. I'll be by with a pizza. I said, come on by. So with our robe on, we'd all get out in the living room and eat the pizza. 
with this government investigator who had a career of investigating fraud. He's a very interesting guy. I learned a lot from him. He'd put his bib overalls on and his straw hat, and he'd go down into Virginia, and he'd find out all kinds of cor corruption and illegality. And, you know, he, 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 was, he was cool. He was just a cool guy. I, I loved to spend time with him, two to four in the morning. He didn't do it every week, but... Every couple months, he'd be back on the East Coast to report in on the fraud and the, the investigations he was doing. So the idea of greeting one another is to get beyond our social status and to recognize the importance of other people, regardless of well-educated, uneducated, or whatever. Uh, the fourth aspect, and in the Christian community, this... This is to be exercised and practiced as a way of embracing the value of other people. Uh, the fourth uh, aspect of this greeting one another is it actually affirms yourself. It, when, when we greet, greet one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you and all who are in Christ Jesus. The, the idea of wedding together peace and wholeness with the gesture of greeting people is a way of doing something that's good for us. In other words, it's good for us to acknowledge the presence of other people because we're saying we have a life that we're willing to share with you in our friendship. So we greet one another. It's a way of actually affirming. It's like love your neighbor as yourself. We have a problem loving other people if we can't understand ourselves. They, it's, it works together. So how is this practiced in the home? Well, our children are worth talking with. Our mates are worth talking with. Our relatives are worth talking with. Um, I would invite people over uh, to my garage to s sit down when, in Enola. Um, just come on over and we'll have a sit and spit. Now, that's usually an expression given to people who chew, and I don't chew, and my friends didn't chew, but it's a colloquial expression meant to come on over and we'll have a visit. Come on over, we'll sit and spit. And we just, just visit of taking time to uh, share our lives with other people. This is, this is an expression um, that's important, and we share this uh, in our home where we have time to sit and visit and talk and interact with our children, with our grandchildren, with our spouses, with our neighbors, with our friends. Um, it's practiced in the home. It's practiced in the gathered church. Uh, some of you might have known Steve Reed. Uh, he lived in Spartansburg or somewhere near Spartansburg. He passed away in the last year. But he and I had, now I didn't meet him until we moved up here in November 2020, but um, he, w we had extended conversations. Uh, when we'd meet at Cox's auction or we met in the town, his kids lived down the street from us, and uh, he, he talked about, he, he said he, he never understood why people left church so fast. He wanted to hang around and talk and visit and, and interact. I don't know if any of you knew Steve, but anyway, we had, we had many conversations about the value of, of interacting with God's people when, when we're together. And um, my Roman Catholic priest friend uh, in Bowie uh, joked about, don't, don't ever get, at, at his church, don't ever get near the exit where the cars are coming out. You'll get run over. You know, it just uh, there's a certain amount of time that was allotted by his parishioners to go to church, and you better get out of the way because when that service is over, you know they're tearing on to what's next. And well, Steve Reed never understood that, and and uh, the the whole idea, the whole idea of of being together and spending time together and showing interest in other people, it takes time, it's a, matter, it's a matter of time. So we practice this in our home of time for people. We practice this in the gathered church where we affirm and encourage one another and we hang around, we visit. And uh, 
We don't have to necessarily have an agenda other than just connecting with people. It's important. It's important time. And um, in the Christian community at large, of taking time for other Christian people to visit with them and to have fellowship, and even non-Christian people of spending time with them. This is, this is uh, why we're here. There are at least two kinds of time described in the Bible. One is chronological time, that's chronos, and one is kairos, which is significant time. When the Greek translator translated the Ecclesiastes passage about time, he used the word kairos to refer to a time to die, a time to be born, a time for this, a time for that. These are significant words. It's significant time. It's not chronological time. It's Monday night. You're in Washington, D.C. The Dallas Cowboys are playing the Washington Redskins. What time is it? It's not 9 o'clock. It's D week in Washington, D.C. It's a different kind of time. People will stay up till midnight or after midnight watching the game. They'll be so dead the next morning. Uh, it just it's a special kind of time. It's, okay. When we meet people, it's not chronological time. It's Kairos time. It's time to connect uh, with one another. Now, every sermon should have three things. And I introduced last week the fourth thing. The fourth thing is an end. And uh, what I conclude with is every sermon should have something to know. And what I know, based on the one another's that are applied to greeting one another, that I know that God is interested in his people connecting with one another. And if he talked about these things 68 times, then this is an important thing. And one of those things is the greeting of one another, of connecting visually, verbally, a handshake, a pat in the back. You know, I, when I go to my class reunions, I always ask people who I haven't seen for a long time, are you a hugger? Are you a shaker? Are you a fist bumper? Are you a nodder? You know, what, what are you comfortable with? And then, then that's, that's what I do. And um, so whatever you're comfortable with, that, that's what I do. And I know that God is interested in us connecting with one another. I believe this. I not only know it, I believe that there is great value in this connection because the Lord speaks about it. So I believe this. This is part of my belief system. And then um, every sermon should have something to do. And what I do is I make an attempt to, to greet people. I did this. I, didn't do, I do this in business. I'm talking about my life in the past. But I greet people. I meet people. I welcome people. I acknowledge people. It doesn't matter whether I'm in church or I'm in business or whatever. And... This is not a function of personality. This is a function of connecting with mankind that, that I'm part of. I'm here on earth to connect for God and to connect with God's people. So let's be doers of the word and meaningfully connect with one another because this is part of a profile that we are to live in as the people of God. And we never know, we never know what our connecting means to the person we're connecting to. You know, when I was hauling oil, I might be the only human voice people would hear all day long or for several days. And uh, I wasn't out to socialize, but yes, I would have a cup of coffee while they wrote the check. And if their daughter was there and made raisin-filled cookies, I would drink a cup of coffee and eat a raisin-filled cookie while I got the check. And you ne so we never know when we heed the injunction to greet one another, the benefits that come our way and the other way as well. Paul, time to sing again and then we're out of here. We're slowly out of here. Sí.
Please stand and we'll sing the first verse of hymn number 370, Faith of Our Fathers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. Amen.